Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the content patch for the 21st of June 2013. My name is Total Biscuit with today's gaming news and comment. Coming up in the show, following the Xbox One policy reversal announcement, EA confirms that it will not be bringing back online pass. The War Z renames itself to Infestation Survivor Stories. The curious case of Paranautical Activity, Fist Puncher and Steam Green Light and game sharing may be coming to Steam according to some lines found in the latest beta build of the client. All this and the OC Remix track of the day is coming your way right about now. Unsurprisingly, the announcement by Microsoft has had something of a domino effect that has resulted in many other organizations also speaking up on the issue. No doubt we'll be hearing an awful lot more about it over the next week. And can I just throw out a prediction here? Like, I'm going to put... I'll put $50 down on this, right? That what we're going to see in the next week is a dramatic reversal of opinion where everybody mourns the now missing features that the Xbox One had and said, isn't it a shame that people are holding back the technological advancement of the gaming industry? That is what's going to happen, and I very much doubt that I'll be wrong. Anyway, besides the point, EA is one of the first to speak up, and this was, of course, as a direct result of people speculating that the removal of all of this DRM and these restrictions on used games would result in the return of measures such as the online pass system designed to try and mitigate the perceived cost to the industry that used games actually cause. Now, EA says that its decision to discontinue the online pass program is not going to change. This comes straight from the mouth of John Reesberg, the Senior Director of Corporate Communications, which is one of the most obnoxious job titles you could ever hold, I imagine. But regardless, he says there is no change in the decision to discontinue online pass. As we said a few weeks ago, none of our EA titles will include online pass, and we're removing it from existing games as well. Nothing else on today's news, but did want to be clear that our online pass decision was based on player feedback, and there is no change to that. Now, around the time of the announcement of these policies, it was initially speculated, including by me, that the people that pushed for these policies in the first place were the large publishers, rather than it being a unilateral decision there by Microsoft. However, EA did go on record to say that, in fact, they did not push or aggressively lobby for the platform holder to put some gating function in there to allow or disallow used games. That is a quote from Peter Moore, who is the Chief Operating Officer of EA, and that was a quote given to Polygon. He also went on to say that he is a proponent of used games and likes the ecosystem. As to whether or not you actually take that statement at face value, well, that's a different matter entirely, especially bearing in mind, of course, that EA has kind of been at the forefront of using certain technologies or methods to try and reduce the number of used games. They haven't outright come out and said, no, you can't do it anymore, but we are talking about the company behind Project $10 and also one of the pioneers of online pass in the first place. So as to whether or not you would take his word at face value and say, yeah, yeah, we're totally up for used games, it's a nice piece statement, but quite frankly, the past history does not indicate that that is the case at all. Now, the question, I suppose, then becomes, where does it leave EA? Will we see EA move towards a cloud-based system, which could eventually result in the removal of used games? Here's the thing, right? That system was very much built into the infrastructure of Xbox Live, and it was part of the console. Okay, we're going to take that out. What does that leave you with options-wise? Do we really believe that EA is suddenly a proponent of used games, bearing in mind all the stuff they've done over the past few years? We shouldn't. I mean, that would be very naive. I don't believe that is the case. I believe that if they could remove used games, they very much would. What can they do in the short term to mitigate this perceived damage? And, you know, you can argue about this till you're blue in the face. So some of us believe that used games do inherently damage the industry, but there are strong counter-arguments against that. It's a very difficult discussion. I'd, I don't necessarily think there is a right answer on it. But what would they do if they believed that used games do damage? And I am of the belief that they do think this. You know, if they didn't, then online pass wouldn't even be a factor. So, what do they do? Well, in the short term, what they can do is they can release significantly more DLC or microtransaction-based content. The reason you would do that is because it bypasses the need to raise money from the actual physical sale of the game. Yeah, they would prefer, of course, that people bought the game and then bought a bunch of DLC, but what you can do with DLC is regardless of who owns that copy, you can end up 
selling additional copies of the same DLC. It's actually potentially beneficial to them. Let's say a copy of a game gets bought. Okay, so there's the first sale done. It then gets traded in. It then gets bought again. By this point, some DLCs come out. The guy that bought it again picks up a DLC pack or a microtransaction or something along those lines. He gets sick of the game eventually, then trades it in. Someone else then buys it at a lower price. It's like, oh no, the money's not going to EA. But what happens when that guy picks it up? There's more DLC out. He buys more DLC. Maybe he even buys the same DLC as the previous owner. You sell the same piece of DLC for one copy of the game twice. So in that respect, you do compensate. Do you compensate as much? Not necessarily. Obviously, they would prefer that that person had also picked up a new game. So let's say three people own the same game. They would have preferred that was three new copies and then three pieces of DLC as opposed to one new copy and three pieces of DLC. But regardless, that is a factor. It is a way to mitigate, and it would not surprise me in any way, shape, or form if we see an increase in DLC and post-release paid-for content. It is a way to compensate for all of this stuff, and with these new networks, and with this emphasis on digital, I don't see why you wouldn't do that. That's the short term. What about the long term? The long term is a little more insidious. The long term, of course, is the power of the cloud, which of course sounds like a buzzword, but we know for a fact that both Forza 5 and Titanfall are looking to use cloud processing technology in some way to enhance the game. This will require an always-on connection. If you're playing that game, and if it has cloud processing enabled in some way, you will need to be connected to make use of that. Now, initially, we may see it being an optional feature. That's a possibility. But as we go on, it is more and more likely that cloud processing will be used to supplement the game itself, and more to the point, supplement the console. As the console gets older and older, cloud processing may be required to keep up with technology and to actually keep up with the level that people expect from these games. As a direct result, we will see a move towards always-on internet connection requirements for third-party titles. If this is the case, then we could see, only then could we see some form of anti-use game DRM in the form of some kind of access code. Of course, we're talking about something very much like Steam. We're talking about something like SimCity. EA has done this before. They talked about cloud processing as being required for SimCity, and that was their justification for always on DRM. Of course, we cried foul at the time, and it turns out we were absolutely right. This stuff was one, not required, and two, completely unreliable, and ended up being an albatross around the neck of that particular title. It would not surprise you in the slightest, bearing in mind that both companies have flat out said we are not going to dictate to third parties exactly what they do with codes and actual anti-use game DRM. Yeah. Sony outright said this. They did say they wouldn't be allowing online passes, yeah? but that does not mean that there aren't other ways around it. If these companies want to have an always-on requirement, they are actually free to do so. And if they have that requirement, at that point, they can then implement something which would act as anti-use game DRM. Most likely in the same way that Steam does it, it would just be an access code that then becomes bound to your account, and there is no getting out of that. That's the long term. Again, that's all very much speculation, but it would not surprise me in the slightest if that were to occur. So... It's something that is worth remaining vigilant on. We should, of course, reward and praise companies that make the right moves and that actually listen to their consumers and that are attempting to repair their image. Yeah, EA is currently on one of those upswings. It's not the first time it's done it during the era of Activision dominance when they were the evil overlord of everything and all the stuff that Bobby Kotick was saying was being plastered all over the internet. EA was actually doing good things. They were doing things to really raise their profile with consumers and then they became the big evil again. It all, it's all peaks and troughs with these guys. So just, just keep an eye on them, okay? Just don't let them get away with it. The War Z is now known as Infestation Survivor Stories, certainly by no means the first game to change its name in an effort to shed a bad image. Another game, of course, would be Orion Dino Horde, previously Orion Dino Beatdown, and another title by the name of Merchants of Brooklyn, which was renamed Drug Wars after receiving one of the lowest set of scores in Metacritic history. Now, we have a change in name for the War Z to Infestation Survivor Stories, and there are, of course, a few reasons why this would be the case. 
The most obvious and prominent reason is the fact that they actually lost their trademark. The War Z had its trademark suspended by the US Patent and Trademark Office. This is most likely the case because it was far too similar to World War Z, which is of course an established brand and the title of a movie that has just recently been released. It's also the case that there is a video game based on the World War Z movie currently in development, so this has essentially forced the change in name. The other thing which has forced the change in name is the fact that the bloody game has so much negative nonsense surrounding it that there's really no way the title could ever possibly redeem itself. For the ignorant, renaming the title is a great way to at least get rid of some of that negative PR. Admittedly, of course, People like us know the truth and will follow it, but changing your logo, changing your banner, changing your name, this is a fairly decent way of trying to at least dump some of the bad PR and make a little bit of a fresh start. The title was recently on sale and was indeed a top selling title on Steam, one assumes because people are ridiculously stupid and will buy anything that is $3 or less. Thankfully, Metacritic has adjusted its page and now redirects the Warzy directly to Infestation Survivor Stories and has carried over all of its previous ratings. This is no doubt not the last that we will hear of the Warzy, aka Infestation Survivor Stories. It is just a gift that keeps on giving, a gigantic train wreck that has been happening in slow motion for the past year. I would like to follow up on a story that I covered a couple of weeks ago. Now, this was the case of Paranautical Activity, a title by a two-man indie studio called Code Avarice that had received publishing rights from the Adult Swim organization, a company that had already put up the titles Super Puzzle Platformer Deluxe and Super House of Dead Ninjas. The story goes that the title had a green light page up when it acquired its publisher, and when the publisher presented the game to the guys over at Valve, Valve declined, saying that it did not wish for indie developers to believe that getting a publisher was somehow a way to get around green light. That was basically what Code Avarice's Mike Morbeck claimed that Valve actually said. Doug Lombardi from Valve did comment on it, saying that we review Greenlight votes, reviews, and a wide variety of factors in the Greenlight process. However, our message to indies regarding publishers is do it for your own reasons, but do not split your royalties with a publisher expecting an automatic yes on Greenlight. Some people also speculated that the reason the game was denied was the fact that it had a Greenlight page and was attempting to get a publisher at the same time, and they believed that you could only do one or the other, although this would not appear to have been confirmed by Valve. Now, this is obviously a very awkward situation, a very difficult and unfortunate situation for Code Avarice. However, things have got a little bit more interesting in the past week or so. Now, I waited a week before actually talking about this story simply because I wanted to give both Valve and Adult Swim a chance to respond. We sent them multiple emails to their PR accounts over the past week, gave them a full week to get a response, but unfortunately they decided not to email us back. So I don't really have any choice but to go with the information that I currently have on this. So the situation is that a title by the name of Fist Puncher, which of course you may have seen on both Dodger and Jesse's channel, they are in fact in the game, if you can believe that. A title that is coming out on June the 21st, that of course would be today, and is done by a team called Team 2-Bit, has made its way onto Steam, bypassing the Greenlight process while being published by Adult Swim Games. Now, this is a very strange situation because it would appear to be identical to the Code Avarice Paranautical Activity scenario. However, it seems that Fist Puncher has been allowed through, whereas Paranautical Activity has not. Now, let me talk to you a little bit about why these situations are extremely similar. Both titles were indie games. Both titles were picked up by Adult Swim in a publishing agreement. Both titles were presented to Valve, and both titles did not successfully go through Greenlight, yet had a Greenlight page up at the time of the publishing agreement being signed. In fact, the Greenlight page for Fist Puncher was then deleted. However, it was in fact running since September the 2nd, 2012. Now, the game was not successfully greenlit. It never made it through the green light process. It has been sitting on there since 2012. This would appear to be an identical scenario to Paranautical Activity, even using exactly the same publisher. And yet we can clearly see Fist Puncher was allowed onto Steam, whereas Paranautical Activity was not. 
Now, I want to make it, of course, abundantly clear that I do not blame the guys behind 2-Bit at all for this situation. It is clearly not their fault. They were given a deal, they accepted the deal, they got onto Steam. That's it. You know, that's all that they really had to do. They did not maliciously do anything to circumvent the system. They simply took an offer that they were given. But I would like to know exactly what the difference was. It seems to me, and this is of course speculation, I would love to hear some clarification on this, that paranautical activity has been used as an example. Eh? As in, Valve has made an example of this title and the two people behind it to try and stop people from bypassing the green light system as they call it. And yet, th the thing is that people bypass the green light system all the damn time. There's a wide variety of different reasons for it as well. With Cranky Cat, for instance, we had a game that had a previous deal over a year ago with Steam before Greenlight even actually came into effect that was able to eventually release. And yet there are plenty of other titles that have made their way onto Steam regardless of not being backed by a major publisher and regardless of not being involved in Greenlight in any way, shape or form. Perhaps you'd like a few examples. Okay, that shouldn't be too much of a problem. Let's start with Agriculture Simulator 2013. The publisher of this title has never released a game on Steam before. The developer only put out one title, and that was two years ago, Agriculture Simulator 2011. This game never made it to green light. Cube Tractor. Self-published by Ludo Chip. No previous releases, yet no green light. Expeditions Conquistadors. This is a title that got kickstarted, barely made it, was on Greenlight for a while, their page was then deleted, and then they were published by BitComposer. There are plenty more examples if you take into account the issue with Wadget Eyes, where after putting out several games on Steam, they were not allowed to put out Primordia unless they ran Primordia through Greenlight. Now, this does not seem to have applied to Arkan Games, who were able to release Skyward Collapse after releasing several other titles on Steam and not going through green light. This is the problem. There are so many flagrant examples, and that took me about 20 minutes to find. Imagine how many more I could find if I kept digging. There are so many examples of the double standards, ridiculous moving goalposts, and apparent complete lack of regulation here. There's no consistency. If they had a set of rules and just said, right, okay, this is what's going to happen, and then that, as they say, was that, then I would be fine with it. It's their store. They have the right to do whatever they want. But what I want to see is them to actually say what it is that they want. What are they allowing and what are they not allowing? And more to the point, did they, in fact, simply make an example of paranautical activity? Did these guys suffer as a result of some misguided backhanded threat to indie devs saying you cannot bypass our great and glorious system even after they've said that green light is in fact not what they envisioned and that they were even looking into the idea of phasing it out entirely i mean good lord consistency please that curate your content as you will but do so in a consistent and fair manner either it's okay to be published by a known and respected publisher or it's not which is true. Why can Adult Swim publish Fist Puncher and not publish Paranautical Activity? What was the difference there exactly? Why is it okay for Expeditions Conquistadors to be on green light, then mysteriously not be on green light, and then be published by Bit Composer? Why is that okay, and yet the Paranautical Activity situation wasn't? I really want to know. I do. Because you know what I see here? I see a two man indie studio getting screwed over because someone wanted to make an example of them. And that is not cool. And it is not okay. And quite frankly, I do not want to shut up about it until we get a reasonable answer on this. And finally, a little bit of positive rumor surrounding Steam right now, and an interesting little piece of code that popped up in the latest beta version of Steam itself. Now, this code very specifically shows something called a shared game library, and also shows some interesting text in regards to the idea that you would be able to have someone else playing a game that you currently own, and then the system would give them a warning that they were about to be kicked off because you would be logging on to play that same game. 
interesting really the full text is available in the description below this video for you to peruse but this does indicate that there is the possibility that in future there will be some kind of shared game library which would allow your say friends or family to access your steam account in a legitimate way now bear in mind you can already share your steam account details with other people but it is against the terms of service and you can actually be banned for account sharing admittedly we don't generally hear of that happening but it is against the terms of service so you are taking a rather large risk if you do that. Now, this news did come out, of course, before the Xbox announcement, so one has to wonder, one, exactly how complete this system is, two, if they have any intention of implementing it or if they're just messing around with it, and three, whether or not Microsoft's rescinding of the policies surrounding the Xbox One's used game DRM and in turn also removing the family sharing systems and that kind of thing from the Xbox Live service would actually affect the likelihood of this system being put into place. And one would imagine that this system was being put in as a response to that kind of functionality. If it isn't there anymore, then does Valve really have any incentive to put it in? More to the point, would publishers agree to it? Bear in mind that allowing the sharing of this kind of stuff is generally against the licenses that the games are provided with. And while we can kind of bend those rules, and it's very much a gray area for a lot of people when it comes to the terms of service, for Valve, it most likely is not. They have pre-existing agreements with these publishers, and they have to respect that. So I would imagine that if they were to put a system like this in place, they would be looking to work with publishers to enable it for specific titles. I cannot imagine that this would be available across the board if it were to come out. I would think certain games would be share enabled, just like some of them are cross-play enabled with the PC and the Mac. And as a direct result, you would be able to share some of your titles with family members or friends, and maybe there would be some kind of trial restriction on it. Like the idea that something that had a short single player campaign would be shared, beaten by somebody for no cost whatsoever, and then there'd be no chance of them actually buying it. Yeah, that, that doesn't seem all that likely. Regardless, though, it's a system that if it does come into place, I'm personally looking forward to because I am quite frankly sick and tired of having to have only one of my Steam accounts logged in at any given time. Since I now game quite a bit on my Razer Edge tablet, I want the ability to download games on one system while playing on the other on the same Steam account. I currently cannot do that. It's got to be one or the other. If I want to download games for my tablet, I've got to be offline on my Steam account on my main PC, which often is not really an option. So I think that this is certainly a positive thing the question i suppose is whether or not it will even come to fruition all right folks before i go i'd like to remind you that we do have a new t-shirt out that's going to be a limited edition release it will go off sale on the 3rd of july so that's available over on rodeoarcade.com we call it archmage reckoning there are also posters iphone cases and a bundle available if you want to go and check that out that's rodeoarcade.com and i'd like to give you the ocr extract of the day if you don't mind why would you not? Generally speaking, I would say don't screw with the Jazz Jackrabbit soundtrack. Why? Well, because it was by Alexander Brandon, who has created music for Unreal Tournament as well as Deus Ex in the past. So usually you don't want to mess around with that. However, there was one man brave enough or stupid enough to do that by the name of Maze Dude, and he did create a fairly lengthy remix called Jazz Jackrabbit Transformer. Like everything that Maze Dude does, it is quite the thing. Whether you love it or hate it, you certainly can't deny that there have been some very interesting changes put into this track. I like it a lot. Hopefully you do too. You can download it in the description below this video. Please have a safe and wonderful weekend, folks, and I will see you next time.